Hallelujah. Can we celebrate the word with a shout? Glory. Amen. You can be seated with your sweet smart self as we get into the word today. All right. Matthew 28 from verse 18 to 20. When Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Next verse. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Next verse. Teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Jesus in saying all power is given to me, is not teaching from the book of Matthew. And is not teaching from Acts of the Apostles. Neither is he teaching from the book of Colossians. When he said all power is given to me in heaven and on earth, he was teaching from the old testament books he wasn't teaching from matthew <laughs> when we say the word of god the word of god preached by brother paul the word of god preached in the book of acts is the old testament is the old testament you know matthew was only writing what jesus taught so he must have been teaching from somewhere. <laughs> Matthew just recorded eyewitness account. Matthew was in the audience. Jesus was teaching. Then Matthew recorded what Jesus taught. So when Jesus now walked in their midst and he said, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. He was teaching them from the Old Testament books. And um, uh, it's important for me to quickly say this because, um, you know, by virtue of where we are as a church, I can safely say what I want to say now. That, that Old Testament and New Testament of the Bible is not inspired by God. It's not inspired by God. Because in the original, there is no Old Testament and there is no New Testament divided. It is a privilege of translators who split the book. Just like chapter and verses are not inspired by God. Chapters and verses were the privilege of translators. They added all of that. That's not in the original. In the original, you just have a, a later. A later that started from Genesis and just ran to Revelation without chapter verses and punctuations there's no punctuation there's no chapter there's no verse in the original and there's no division of old and new testament now that's important for you to know it's translators who took the privilege of translating and added all of that which of course in bible interpretation that is some sort of interpretation but that's not accurate interpretation because that is what gives people the impression to think that there is a god of the old testament and a god of the new testament which does not exist anywhere right and so you will need to grow and mature and be in a word church like this to understand what i just said to you so that when you read the bible you won't have that mindset you will have the mindset of someone who is learned so that title old testament and new testament was not inspired by god because the people who wrote like i said didn't write it as old testament okay now that attempt has really caused a lot of problem because some people think once they start reading the book of matthew they're reading the new testament but they forget that there is more there is more new testament in the old testament than there is in the new testament you didn't hear what i said there is more new testament in the old testament than there is in the new testament because the new testament is drawn out from the old testament Keep that somewhere it will come in handy in the course of this. So Jesus taught from the books we refer to as the Old Testament. 
And uh, that is Genesis to Malachi. And there's nothing in the Bible that says that there is a distinction between Genesis to Malachi and Matthew to Revelation. Just an idea that comes up years after the Bible was written. When John, for example, wrote John chapter 1 verse 1, and he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word there is the word Logos. Logos. And it's referring to Genesis. In Genesis was the word. The word beginning is Genesis. He calls Genesis the word of God. He calls Genesis the word of God. So if Genesis is the word of God, how do you think that the Old Testament is gone? So the concept of the Old Testament and New Testament are derived from studying. It is when you study, you will now know where there is New Testament and where there is Old Testament. You don't use books to divide them. It's in studying, you will know that, okay, this is Old Testament. And in studying, you will know that, okay, this is New Testament. Because there is Old Testament in New Testament and there is New Testament in Old Testament. You will also discover that in the New Testament, there are practices of the Old Testament. And within the books we refer to as Old Testament, we are going to see a lot of New Testament as we study. The reason for Colossians, Ephesians, Thessalonians, Philippians is because they read from Genesis to Malachi. What we call the word of God is fundamentally the Old Testament. That's what we call the word of God. So every time we hear Jesus say something, what he is saying is from the Old Testament. And I'm going to use that in this teaching. Old Testament, New Testament, just for the purpose of this teaching. But whenever I say Old Testament and New Testament, I expect you to know what I'm implying. Huh? Is that clear? I expect you to know. Okay. Now, when Jesus taught, he taught from the Old Testament books which is the word of God. So he says, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. The word authority is the Greek word exousia. Exousia that deals with responsibility or privilege to act. Responsibility or privilege to act or a privilege not to act. And then he says, in heaven and earth. That word heaven and earth is another word that has been transformed in the church world over the years. <laughs> the word heaven and earth. Because we often say that heaven is where believers go to when they die. And it has no verse in the Bible. There's no verse in the Bible that says when believers die, they go to heaven. There's no such verse. If you find it, please bring it to me within the week. But do believers go to heaven when they die? Yes. But it's not written in the Bible. Some people say you are blessed in the heavenly places, but you have to convert it to the natural. Hmm. That's deep, very deep. <laughs> you have to convert it from the spiritual to the natural. People shout, whoa, revelation, rema, remified. <laughs> and then they will not tell you, God wants you to connect. So that by connecting, you can transfer. You know what the connection is? So a seed. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> Preachers can be funny sometimes. When they find an audience that do not do their due diligence. So when you have the word heaven. Because we always thought heaven is where you go to when you die. Or somewhere outside the earth. In fact our view sometimes is so physical. I am going to go to heaven. I am going to go to heaven. So when you die angels will carry you and put you in angelic transporting system. Phew! to heaven so that's like traveling to another planet that's why we thought that in the tower of babel they were traveling to heaven they were trying to get to heaven 
Wow. Where is the heaven? I'm going above the shadows. Shadows? Beyond the clouds. Behind the clouds. Some of you that were there in those days, you know what I just... Above the shadows. Or heaven is a spiritual place. Where? They will tell you outside the earth. That means it's still physical. Or heaven is where God dwells. All right, let's stay with heaven is where God dwells for now. So when he says all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, that means all access in heaven and earth is given to me. So the phrase we require now is that phrase heaven and earth. He uses heaven and earth together. Now there's a huge difference when he uses heaven alone. And when he uses heaven and earth together. They are different. But the moment you see it used together as heaven and earth, there's a particular concept he is talking about. Heaven and earth, therefore, will be Genesis 1-1. All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. So Jesus was preaching from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Because that's the law of first mention. That's the first place we see that. And Jesus speaking about heaven and earth in Matthew was in reference to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. So Jesus was teaching Matthew 28 verse 18 to 20 making reference to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. So let's explore the meaning of that concept in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6 where he prayed or taught what we often call the Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 to 10. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next verse. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth, heaven and earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He says thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Heaven, earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will on earth as in heaven. Now look at that statement. Our father. Our father. Remember. We said again, Jesus is teaching from where? Genesis. It means that God is father where? In Genesis or in the Old Testament. So the concept of God being father is an Old Testament concept. It means it began from Genesis. God being father. So our father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Why did he use the word heaven? Our father which art in heaven. Why the word heaven and earth? If you observe Genesis 1, 1. It says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters the earth darkness the earth darkness darkness the earth and the spirit of god moved upon the face of darkness introducing God's new creation project 
Genesis 1-2 is the introduction of God's new creation project. That is God's redemption plan announced in Genesis 1 verse 2. Darkness on the earth and the spirit of God introducing God's reality. So verse 2 of Genesis 1, the spirit of God was hovering over it, incubating on the earth. Incubating. The darkness there is not the absence of the sun. Because in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1, and God said, let there be light and there was light. God said, let there be light. So the heaven and the earth of Genesis 1, 1 is the spirit of God. The heaven and earth of Genesis 1-1 is the spirit of God. Verse 3, let there be light or me be light. Me be light. The word Yahweh. Yahweh, I will be what I will be. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. Yahweh. So when he says, let there be light, what he means is God is light. God is light. Yahweh, I will be what I will be because I am what I am. So because I am what I am, light be. God is light. God is light. Now, that's why the light there is not the sun, the moon, and the stars. It's not the moon and the sun and the stars. The light there is God himself. Which means a new creation in light. A new creation in light. Please remove your religious caps now. Because we're dealing with accurate knowledge now. There has been darkness and now there's the new creation in the light. So when Jesus says, our father which art in heaven, he is saying the father or God who is a spirit. The father or God who is a spirit. Brother John helps us with that. John 4.23 But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him next verse god a spirit the spirit of god moved upon the face of darkness and god said i am light now god a spirit and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, Theos Numa, God's spirit. Now, rather than use the word spirit in Matthew, you have the word heaven. Matthew didn't use spirit. Matthew used heaven to mean the same thing that Genesis was talking about. John says God is spirit. So in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, 2 and 3, you find a new creation. God is beginning a new heaven and a new earth. A new creation. A new people. That's how the Bible opened up. The Bible opened up introducing God's ultimate project. The new man. The Bible opened up introducing God's project. The new creation in the light now so the word waters waters is understood by theologians to mean people waters the spirit of god hovered over the people moved on the face of the waters that the spirit of god was hovering over the people announcing his new creation plan Stay with me. 
So the spirit of God in all the earth. The word waters means people or nations. So in Genesis 1 to which is the light of God in verse 3 is God starting a project, beginning something. Like light as the answer to darkness. So when Jesus says, our father which art in heaven, he is reading Genesis chapter 1. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, the use of heaven by Bible writers the use of the word heaven. Now look at me everybody. Please look at me. Stop right. I hope you realize that English is not heavenly language. I hope you realize that Greek and Hebrew is not heavenly language. These are earthly created languages for men to use in communicating with one another. So when the writers wrote the Bible, they looked for human language to use to explain the realities. That's why Moses will use spirit. Matthew will use heaven to mean the same thing. So you must understand when we start talking about words, word study in the Bible, we are studying human language to explain spiritual realities. Okay, so now, that word, heaven and earth, is often referred to as the clouds, the atmosphere, and its distance. The clouds, the atmosphere, and its distance. Then the earth where people are. They use that phrase. Heaven in reverence to God. Because the Jews you discover. That Matthew was the one who used that phrase the most. Heaven, 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 earth. Kingdom of heaven. Matthew used it more than anybody else. Kingdom of heaven rather than kingdom of God. Matthew. Because heaven was used like a reverence point for God. Oh God is highly exalted. God is way beyond man. So to explain way beyond man. God in heaven, man on earth. So that was used to show that God's level is not man's level. So the language to explain that is heaven on earth. Where God is and what God does is like heaven compared to earth. So heaven is used to describe God's activities on the earth. Heaven is used to describe God's activities in the earth. Or the work of his spirit. It's not planet. That is very, 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 very far. Rather, where heaven and earth are apart. You look up. You see the, the atmospheric heavens is far. So as far as the heaven is from the earth, that is how far God is from man in his activities and in his personality. So when a man on the earth says, our father which art in heaven is reverence to say, I acknowledge that you are in a realm of your own higher than mine. Which means it shows the distance between man and God and that distance was caused by sin. Heaven and earth is a communication of distance between God and man. And the distance was created by sin. Separation. God has never walked outside the earth since Genesis. 
<laughs> he has no business elsewhere. <laughs> where else will he be walking? He will only walk where men are. <laughs> will he walk in an empty planet? He will walk in an empty planet now. He will walk where men are because his interest is man. So since after Genesis, God has never been found walking elsewhere other than the earth. This is God's focus. But the work of God in the earth is heavenly. Yeah. He has never been found walking outside the earth. But his work in the earth is heavenly. Euphoronius in the Greek. So when Jesus said, Our Father which art in heaven, he is making a distinction in Matthew 5. The first time he mentions Father. Remember, he is reading from the Old Testament. Look at Matthew 5, 43 to 45. You have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be... Jesus is teaching from where? Genesis. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven... For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Give me verse 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. This word, be therefore perfect there, I want you to observe that word very well. Be therefore perfect. Jesus is teaching from the Old Testament. So, where is Jesus teaching be perfect from? Genesis 17 verse 1. And when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Be thou perfect Quoting from Genesis 17 verse 1, even as your father in heaven is perfect. Now, Leviticus 11.44. For I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore sanctify yourselves and you shall be holy. For I am holy. That word holy, there is a word perfect. Perfect. The same word. I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves in any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So when he says the Lord is perfect, the word perfect there is not maturity. It means holiness. Holiness is complete separation and difference from the rest. Complete separation and difference from the rest. Which means be different as your father which is in heaven is different. Which means that when he called God our father in heaven. Was to make a distinction from earthly fathers. Our father in heaven was used to make a distinction. Between our heavenly father and our earthly fathers. That they are not the same and they are operating different realms. Which means, be different as your father is different. Separate. Matthew 5, 45. Your heavenly father, your heavenly Euphrenius, your heavenly father sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Go to Matthew 7 and we will come back to Matthew 5 shortly. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. If you take that verse out of context, you will assume that what he is saying means ask anything that comes to your mind. It's not even possible. You can't ask God anything that comes to your mind. 
Can you ask God to make you God? <laughs> you can't ask God. But when you take it out of context, you can make it say anything. Remember, the scriptures have only life within its context. Once you take a verse out of context, it's dead. The life of any Bible verse is within its surrounding environment. Therefore, it can only be interpreted rightly within the confines of its environment, not outside its environment. Which means, ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened. It's not ambiguous. It's only as it relates within that context. So that you don't start asking things that even you yourself know you are sounding crazy. God, transport me to Mars without any machine. That's the height of illiteracy. Because you are not understanding. God cannot give you anything you ask. So, ask, seek, knock should not be taken out of context. Look at that Matthew 7 verse 8. Let's move a little further. For everyone that asks it, receive it. And he that seeketh, find it. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Remember in chapter 6, in chap when he was talking about ask, you shall receive, seek, you shall find, knock, you shall open. He expected that you have already read chapter 6 before arriving at chapter 7. You can't just go and read chapter 7. Uh -uh. It's a contextual material. There is a build up in the later reading. He expects you to have read chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6. And as a progression of the thought, chapter 7, Acts, you shall receive, seek, you shall find, knock, and the door shall be opened. What does chapter 6 say? Seek first the kingdom. So what you should be seeking, asking, and knocking will be the kingdom. Because in chapter 6, it's already said, seeking first the kingdom of God, that's what to seek. And it's righteousness, and all these other things shall be added. And in chapter 6, he already told you, do not seek what the Gentiles seek. The Gentiles seek for food, they seek for clothes, they seek for car, they seek for money. Don't seek what they seek. For you, seek the kingdom. So when he now says, ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find, he's talking about his kingdom will be available to anybody who seeks, knocks, and asks, it will not be denied. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm teaching here. Because he is teaching in context. He is teaching in context. Now, Matthew 6, 33, then we come back to where we are. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's what to seek. And his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, what are you asking for in chapter 7? The same kingdom in chapter 6. Now then the next thing is Matthew 7, 9 to 11. Or, what man is there of you? Whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or, if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If he then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more that's a word to underline how much more your father won't give you what you give to your children your father will give much more it's not at your level so he won't give what you are giving you're already giving it he doesn't need to duplicate your efforts so the father gives much more and much more is not fish it's not bread it's not eggs your father gives to you on earth who is evil compared to God God can come to your father's level who is evil to be competing with bread and fish when God now will operate from his superior realm which is heaven while you are on earth he won't give earth he will give much more touch your neighbor say there's much more that's what the father gives. If he then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, 
which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him so can you see the distinction now okay now he already told you that when it comes to fish bread that men know how to give such gifts they know how to give such gifts if you come to my house right now I said, the doctor said, if I don't eat eggs, I will die. I will give you 10 crates. It's not a prayer point. Eggs is not a prayer point. In the village, chickens drop eggs as they are moving. And children pick it. It's not a prayer point. The reason why you are not seeing eggs every time is because you left the village long ago. Go back and visit. You will see eggs. You can't be asking God for eggs. <laughs> the chickens in your village will give you. How much more? Oh, glory to God. Somebody shout, I receive much more. That's what your heavenly father gives. What the father gives is the much more. That's why now look at verse 12 of Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets even though he mentioned fish and bread he is not referring to asking material things and by the way if he meant asking for bread egg and fish which of you have that need this morning they're looking for bread to eat fish shouldn't be a prayer point if you block anybody at the closing prayer and say i want egg only egg yes they will buy and give you to eat. That shouldn't be a prayer point. Egg shouldn't be a prayer point. Even if you knock in neighbor's door and say, I'm so hungry, please. If you just give me one boiled egg, I'll be okay. They'll give you. Even if they don't know God. So those are not things to be knocking heaven's door for. And asking and seeking and fasting. My father, my father, what are you waiting for? Eggs. What are you waiting for? Eggs. <laughs> So when he was talking eggs, bread, and fish, he wasn't talking literal. He wasn't talking in literal terms. Let me help you a little more. Luke chapter 11, verse number 10. For everyone that asketh, receive it. And he that seeketh, find it. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Next verse. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil compared to your father, Know how to give good gifts unto your children. Now observe. He makes it clear now. How much more, much more, the much more of the father is, shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? What's the much more? The Holy Spirit. What's the much more? The spirit of adoption. What's the much more? The regeneration. What's the much more? The spirit of his son. What's the much more? The spirit that raised Christ from the dead that dwells on your inside. That's what the heavenly father gives. So he makes it clear. He explains what he has been saying. The Holy Spirit. So he uses heavenly father here. Gives the Holy Spirit. The giving of the Holy Spirit. Is that the new creation? Yes. Born of the Spirit. Born of God. Born again. Now back to Matthew 5.45. That you may be the children of your father. Which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And send it rain on the just and on the unjust, which is in heaven. There's something he's pointing out to. Look at verse 43, Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. 
Wow. He's referring to the Old Testament. Okay. Now, that will be Deuteronomy 23 verse 6. And Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. Deuteronomy 23 verse 6 and Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. That is, you will find love in one, you will find hate in the other. <laughs> you will find love in one, you will find hate. Look at Deuteronomy 23 6 so that we have clarity. Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. Leviticus 19 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself for I am thy Lord. So in one place he said do not seek their prosperity. In another place love them. So it's hate and love. Okay. So the question is. You will find love in one. And you will find hate in the other. Which sounds like a contradiction. You have heard it had been said within the books of the scripture. One says, love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Anyone who is near you. Including a stranger. Neighbor. He said, you have heard. And now I say. Hmm. Look at verse 21 of that Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. You have heard. It's been said by them of old time. The word akios in the Greek. Akios. A-R-C-H-A-I-O-S. Akios in the Greek. Referring to before now. Of old time. Before now. That is referring to the books of the scripture. Matthew 5.33. He repeats it again. Again, you have heard that it had been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not forswear thyself. But shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Referring to what was said before. And I can give you exegesis for that very cheaply for free. Luke 9, 18 and 19. Prophets of old. You have heard it has been said of old. Which people said it of old? The prophets. Luke 9, 8 and 19. Acts 15 verse 7 and 21. Acts 15 verse 7 and 21. Old time. Acts 21, 16. Acts 21, 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. All things are passed away. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 5. The old world, the old world. You have heard it has been said by them of old. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9 and Revelation chapter 20 verse 2. Second Peter 2 5, Revelation 2 9, uh, Revelation 20 verse 2. So it refers to before now. Things that were written or said before the four gospels you have heard it you have read it he says but now i say now i say to you so when he says love those who hate you he didn't say from me he says you are heavenly father and he is reading your heavenly father from the Old Testament. You know, he sends the rain and the sun. Which means, as they read the Old Testament, they will just see what he has just said. The audience he was talking to easily understood what he had said because they were conversant with the Old Testament. It was easy for him to keep telling them what the Old Testament said because they were conversant with the Old Testament. The reason why today when we are teaching from the Old Testament, people have issues is because a lot of people are lazy. But the audience Jesus was talking to were conversant. That's why he just kept saying, you have read it has been said and they knew where he was making reference to. So it was clear, you know. Okay, now. He sends rain. Who sends rain? The father. So he's reading about God in the Old Testament as the one who sends the rain and the sun. We are using the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi in this series. So 
is he contradicting the scriptures you have read it was said but i say is he contradicting that's a critical doctrinal question we want to deal with now for another few minutes is he telling us to choose one and abandon the order of course no those statements require careful investigation see with bible teaching you don't just carry things and be flying around no the bible is an ancient material that requires a lot of diligence in understanding what he is communicating it's not just a book you just stand up and carry. That's why God has appointed teachers in the church to teach. So people can come to a place of maturity. And that's why brother Paul would tell Timothy, you must rightly divide it. You don't just teach it. You've got to. Bible teaching is rightly dividing. Somebody asked me, Dr. Damina, do you have any book on Bible interpretation? I say, everything I teach is Bible interpretation. The whole fulcrum of my teaching is Bible interpretation. Every time I come up here, what am I doing? I'm interpreting the scriptures. So if you want Bible interpretation material, buy everything I have taught. Because everything I teach here is Bible interpretation. There's no particular material for it. All the material it is. Because we don't have anything we do here other than interpreting the Bible. Because it's in the interpretation of the scriptures that the scriptures come alive. And that's where you are fed. And that's where you grow. Those statements require careful investigation. Look at that Matthew 5.45 again. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. On the just and on the unjust. What is he referring to here as the son? He sendeth sun. What is he talking about sun? Is he talking about sunlight? Or is he talking about rainfall? What is sun? Matthew 13, 43. Let's do some work. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who had ears to hear. Let him hear. The word has to do with shining. <laughs> Matthew 17 verse 2. And was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun. And his raiment was white as the light. So sun means to shine. So he's talking about shining. Who shines? He the father shines on the good and on the evil. So the word there has to do with light. Shining. Light. What will light do? Light will be love. Light will bless. Light will pray for. Light will not hate. He makes his son, his light, to love. To bless, including enemies. To pray for. To do good. To both bad and good people. Why? Because he is light. There's no darkness in him. He cannot be otherwise. <laughs> God is light. He cannot be otherwise. He cannot for any reason be anything else other than what he is. No matter who you are. Uh. it is light in contrast to darkness that's what jesus was teaching them in matthew chapter 5 then the next statement he makes he makes his rain the word rain is from another greek word brecho 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 or breco b-r-e-c-h-o rain luke 16 9 to 10 and I say unto you, make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive him to everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in the much. 
just, unjust. The word unjust is the word adikos in the Greek. A-D-I-K-O-S. Unjust. One who doesn't do what is right. Then the word evil is the word poneros in the Greek. P-O-N-E-R-O-S. Poneros. It means wickedness. Now, so Matthew chapter 5 verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Matthew 5, 37 and 39. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than this, comet of evil. 39. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. So we have those who do evil. And we have those who do what is not right. So he says, your heavenly father shines his light. And makes his rain to fall. His rain and his light is how he describes him blessing those who cause and those who do evil he blesses them he does good to them so the sun and the rain is they are figurative of how god responds with his goodness his light to people whether they are good or bad that is your badness does not influence his attitude towards you your evil does not influence God's attitude or God's character. He is good in spite of you. He is good irrespective of you. And there's nothing you can do to make him react. Because he doesn't have it. And a man cannot give what he doesn't have. There's no evil in him. So no matter what you do, the only thing that keeps coming out of him without even his consent is good so both good and bad people god's response to both characters is good when people pray fall and die they don't even know god to start with they don't even know god because if they know god they won't pray those prayers so when those people are praying consider that a native doctor is in operation. Because it's only native doctors who, who say such things. It's only native doctors. You can't find that in Jesus. You can't find that in Jesus' character. He went about doing good. Even at the point of crucifixion. And the height of betrayal, denial and rejection. The only thing that could come out of him is forgive them because that's all he has that's all he has there was nothing in him other than forgive them they don't know what they, he excused their evil there's nothing else in him other than that he's good all the time that's his nature and he doesn't struggle to display it it flows out of him without even knowing. That's his nature. You know what the series is titled? I forgot I didn't even tell you the title. <laughs> I'm too much in a hurry. <laughs> Reflecting the Father. Reflecting the Father. He never struggles to do anything good. He's just good. That's who he is. Oh, glory to God. I say glory to God. Whoa, I tell you. I'm enjoying this. Jesus simply describes actions of men. Contrary to what people have done unto them. Actions of you as God's son must be contrary to what others do to you. So now, what comes to mind... When Jesus was talking about do good to those who despitefully use you. 
Bless those who curse you. He was preaching from Genesis. He was preaching from Genesis. He was teaching from Genesis. So when he will now say, bless those that curse you, do good to those who despitefully use you, where will he be coming from in Genesis? Cain and Abel. Cain rejected God's gift. Cain rejected the gospel. And Cain was to be a fugitive and a vagabond and a wanderer. And Cain said, oh God, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And God put a mark on Cain and said, if anybody touch Cain, I will discipline you. Look at God protecting a murderer and a rejecter of God. Why? Because God does good to those who despitefully use him. He blesses those who curse him. He re responds positively to those who don't treat him well so because we see how god treated cain jesus now said you too the same way your father handled cain and abel's case you handle people who don't like you stand up let's close this service is that clear okay so we will start from there in the next service and then we will arrive at the lord's prayer in that second service glory to god i say glory to god if you're understanding shout glory thank you lord thank you lord don't your neighbor say i am just like my father i have received much more from my father and i give the same to those who love me those who hate me and to everyone i do not have dual character i have consistency of character just like my father tell your neighbor it's not my fault i'm just like my father people say you are too good tell them it's not my fault i'm just like my father people say how can you forgive with all this it's not my fault i'm just like my father how can somebody treat you like that and you're still good to him it's not my fault i'm just like my father somebody say, how can somebody cheat you like this and you're still wishing him well it's not my fault i'm just like my father that's my nature i reflect my father effortlessly amen i've got my father's character I've got my father's eyes. I've got my father's ears. I've got my father's mouth. I'm just like my father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge keeps growing big in this house. Light keeps shining in the dark places. Light keeps shining in our hearts and minds, bringing to bear our realities. Thank you, Father. Now I ask that this revelation keeps growing big on our inside until nothing else matters. And we rejoice that this day, all that makes God, God lives on our inside. And we are boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Thank you, Father. Oh, Father, we give you praise. And I declare for everybody under the sound of my voice, victory is yours eternally in the name of jesus thank you father for answered prayer in jesus precious name and every believer says that amen on a note of finality can i have some celebration in this house glory yeah 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 some of you are not celebrating you're only willing i want some glory